contact. We now come to the important business, is the backbench business, is the Hillsborough disaster, and I would now call Mr Steve Rotherham. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to thank the Backbench Business Committee for granting tonight's debate following the incredible response to the Government's online petition, which attracted 140,000 signatures in just a couple of weeks. It is because those people took the time to push the Government for the release of the Hillsborough documents that today we are having the first ever parliamentary de debate resulting from a neat petition. Although, after a fight for justice that has lasted 22 years, even this minor concession was called into question following last week's shenanigans in this chamber. I would also like to thank colleagues for the fantastic support and response from nearly 100 MPs from nine separate political parties who supported the application to the Backbench Business Committee. This is a victory for democracy, a victory for people power, but it remains to be seen whether it will be a victory for the families. They have been let down so many times that they will not be surprised if there are those that would prefer to, for this to simply just go away. For those that foolishly believe this might be a potential outcome from tonight's debate, let me make it absolutely clear from the start. This issue will never just go away, not until there is justice for the 96. Mr Deputy Speaker, during this debate, I will set out why I believe it's an important issue for this House to consider, albeit a bit late in the day, and outline why it is essential to press the Government on its commitment to release all papers relating to the Hillsborough disaster. I believe that all sides of the House should agree to the terms of the motion, but if not, it is my intention to press this House to a vote. My hope is that common sense and ultimately justice will prevail. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to begin by setting out the context to the disaster as there is a fundamental misunderstanding of what happened on the 15th of April 1989 and in the dark days, weeks, years and ashamedly decades that followed. There have only been a few occasions in my life when I've been completely overwhelmed by the emotion of the event that I was witnessing. The birth of my three wonderful children, the death of my beloved mum and loss of close friends and relatives. However, there is one other event that will live with me for the rest of my life, and that is the tragedy at Sheffield on that beautiful spring day, 22 years, six months and two days ago. Before 1989, Hillsborough was just the name of one of England's famous old football grounds. But for the last two decades, the word Hillsborough has evoked memories of Britain's worst ever sporting disaster. It was a day when I helplessly watched frantic scenes as people that had travelled to see a football match, some mere children, lay injured and dying as they were pulled from the terraces. I was one of the lucky ones that day, and all of my close friends and members of my family returned home, although for one, our Lisa, it was touch and go whether she would survive. Thankfully, she did. This unfortunately was not the case for 96 men, women and children who were killed and for hundreds of others injured and left permanently traumatised. The loss of 96 innocent lives was bad enough, Mr Deputy Speaker, but the tragic nature of their deaths was exacerbated by what happened next. Instead of those at fault taking responsibility for their actions, a coordinated campaign began to shift the blame and look for scapegoats. To this day, nobody has been held to account for Hillsborough. Mr De Deputy Speaker, a half-day debate, though welcomed, is not long enough to go into all of the details of this gross 22-year injustice, 
So I will concentrate on the three main pillars of the accusations against Liverpool fans, namely that thousands turned up late and were ticketless, were drunk and aggressive, and broke down a gate causing a catastrophic crush. Is it any wonder that some people have doubtful and distorted views as to the ex exact cause of the disaster when misinformation began almost immediately after the players were led off the pitch at 3.06? The BBC and ITV News that very afternoon misreported what had occurred and it is important to understand the effect this had as it formed the immediate public perception of Hillsborough. To fully understand what I mean, people will need to suspend their predisposition to believe the Hillsborough myths and listen to tonight's debate with an open mind before jumping to conclusions. But the faux pas committed in the immediate aftermath when there was much uncertainty and a degree of confusion pales into insignificance when you consider the malicious manner in the way some sections of the press reported things and which still clouds thinking today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At 3.15, Graham Kelly, the then chief executive of the Football Association, went to the police control box, where he was told by the now discredited match commander that Liverpool fans had rushed the gate into the ground, creating the fatal crush in the central pens. This was cowardice and deceit of the highest order, as the fact was that no gate had been rushed, and Duckenfield, the match commander, himself had personally ordered the gate to be opened. But this disgraceful lie set the tone for all that came later. At 4.15, Kelly was interviewed by the BBC, and he told them that the police had implied to him that the gate had been broken down by fan fans to gain access. Notwithstanding the fact that there was absolutely no basis to these lies, Kelly allowed himself to be embroiled in his treachery, although he simply may have wished this version of events to be true, as by then he probably realised that the dysfunctional organisation that he headed up would quite rightly be criticised for their part in the unfolding disaster. Why didn't the FA listen? I suppose we'll never know. However, and without any evidence to back it up, these lies were reported by some news organisations and the story was flashed across the world as fact, repeating the line that drunken Liverpool fans had forced the gate open. Just a few days later, before people had even had time to arrange funerals for their loved ones, the Sun newspaper infamously printed the banner headline the truth on the personal instruction of its editor, Kelvin McKenzie. It claimed that drunken fans had forced the gates open because they did not have match tickets, that they had stolen from the corpses lying around the pitch, assaulted police officers in the emergency services, robbed cameras and other equipment from press photographers, and urinated on police officers helping the victims. This was one of the cruelest blows, and it beggars belief that certain sections of the media still give airtime to this most despicable man to vent his bile and mendacity. Yeah, yeah. Given what he said about the Prime Minister the other day, there may even now be some Tories that agree that this man is a pariah, as we on Merseyside know him to be. This is a man who preaches about free speech, but he, who dehumanised the deaths of 96 people for a cheap headline. What an absolute <coughs> hypocrite. Months later, the rag he edited admitted that the allegations it had made were totally false, but the damage had been done. To this day, the people of Merseyside do not buy that paper. But it's taken the Hackgate allegations with the Murdoch's News International for people to at long last sit up and take notice of the claims that we made 22 years ago, that there may be some truth to our allegations of collusion between the press, certain politicians and the police. Mr Deputy Speaker, 
the actual loss of life from Hillsborough will never be fully known. Yes, we know that 96 people died as a direct result of the injuries that they sustained at the stadium. But many have subsequently died, some tragically by committing suicide, and others who have simply died of a broken heart at the loss of their loved ones. However, I've been careful not to base my account of events on emotion. In fact, I have ensured that I have clear and referenced evidence to support all of my contentions. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is claimed that truth is the first casualty of war, but the same can be said for Hillsborough. Misdirection, obfuscation and damn lies were all used as smokescreens to deflect attention away from the guilty. Institutional complacency and gross negligence coupled with an establishment cover-up have added to the sense that this was an orchestrated campaign to shift blame from those really responsible onto the shoulders of Liverpool fans. There are many myths that have been perpetrated about the events of the 5th of April 1989, and perhaps the only way these will be addressed is once the Hillsborough Independent Panel, set up by my right honourable friend, the member for Lee, concludes its deliberations and reports back next year. That is why it's so important to give them all of the pieces of the jigsaw so that they can complete a full and accurate picture of events. So what are the facts about the Hillsborough disaster? For those that believe it was simply caused by fans turning up late, you are wrong. You are wrong. In spite of a misprint on tickets requesting fans to turn up at 2.45, and despite the fact that Liverpool fans only had 23 dilapidated turnstiles to enter the ground, while Forest fans had access through 60, half of the 10,100 supporters were already in the ground before 2.30. But there was congestion outside, and it was obvious that with 5,000 supporters still to enter the ground at 2.30, there needed to be a delay in kick-off. Anyone who's ever been to a match knows that there is always a higher entry rate as kick-off time approaches. And two years previously, there had been a delayed kick-off to allow fans to get into the ground, but not this time. Instead, the response to the build-up and congestion outside was to open a gate and to allow fans onto the concourse with disastrous consequences as there were no stewards or police inside to direct supporters into the half-empty pens and away from the packed central pens. Signage was poor and the design of the Leppens Lane meant that around 2,000 of this group made their way into the ground and headed straight for a tunnel marked standing leading directly to pens three and four. This influx caused severe crushing and some fans began climbing over the lateral fences into the half-empty pens on either side to escape. It was later estimated that more than 3,000 supporters were admitted to the central pens, almost double the safe capacity. At five minutes past three, a crush barrier gave way in pen three, causing people to fall on top of each other. Cries to the police for help were audible, but went unheard. Mr Speaker, another falsehood was the claim that these were ticketless fans, but even officers at the turnstiles rejected this, and the HSE, who later analysed the evidence of all those that entered this end, concluded that the total numbers were between 9,373 and 10,124. The capacity was 10,100. And so the myth of ticketless fans can also be dispelled. And just to confirm this, so as to leave no doubt, the Taylor report stated that there was no substance that ticketless fans caused the disaster. Unfortunately, this smear still impairs and prejudices the thinking of some 
who have heard the apocryphal tales of Tikhot's family.